So, when a particular person is trying to use the formula, it should be easy to use also. And therefore, they found that what uh, these two scientists come engineers have suggested is actually easy to use. Let us pass on to now composite construction. See this term in shipbuilding started long back when passenger crafts or the passenger ships were very much in use. Air traffic was very expensive and I suppose transatlantic air traffic was not there at all. At that time, people used to move around the globe on ships only. The fact was known that the center of gravity of the ship plays an important role in the stability of the vessel. And the reputation of a passenger ship used to fall if the vessel used to severely roll and pitch. And that was only likely when the center of gravity is going high up. Two things, if it is too high up, then it will roll heavily and pitch heavily. If it is too low, then it will uh, have a very slow time period and it will lead to high acceleration. So, both ways uh, it was not suitable for the passengers. They were not seafarers. The crew gets used, the crew and officers after a certain time period they will get used to this because this is their bread and butter and they have to better understand how to live with the sea conditions with those motions. But a passenger would like to pay and travel. So, if one particular vessel is not comfortable, they will try to wait for the other vessel and take the ticket in that. They will avoid a particular vessel and try to prefer another one and the business will be shifted from one to another. So, G plate, the centroid played a very important role as far as the economy of passenger ships are concerned or likely of or affinity towards a particular passenger ship. <coughs> Number two, the rules and regulations were there and if one would like to give a passenger accommodation under the main deck, that also people never liked. You have to see through the portholes. But if you are having an accommodation above the main deck, then you can go to the promenade and see around and so on and so forth. So, the tendency was that to provide accommodation above the main deck at the cost of losing the G, GM and therefore, this concept of composite construction in those days cropped up that why not use a lighter material over the deck construction. Use the material, the usual mild steel for the up to the deck construction part and above the deck you try to use some sort of a light material. Obviously, lighter than that used to be uh, wood, but again something went ag against wood is uh, it is highly inflammable. So, you require fire resistance, you require this resistance, water resistance etcetera, etcetera. So, people used to prefer steel only, but steel had this uh, disadvantage. And then, uh, I do not know who was the first to suggest it, but they found that aluminum alloy can be used as the above deck material for accommodation, which is much lighter though expensive, but much lighter. And it had other plus points that the corrosion property in the sea atmosphere is much better compared to uh, steel hull. And therefore, it was tried out that yes, you can give the comfort to the passenger, but not at the cost of loss of GM, but at the loss of initial investment. 
you may have to invest more. So, ultimately with the material properties known, they found that uh, the cost at that time may go to 10 times, but the weight saving was two third. That means, if you have uh, W ton of steel to make the superstructure or the above deck accommodation, you require W by 3 quantity, W by 3 tons of aluminum alloy to provide the same accommodation with the equivalent strength, but at 10 times the cost. But this saving was very good because you are attracting the people and a little bit of this cost was offset by that because of the occupancy level increased and because of the good corrosion properties, the maintenance cost is reduced and that also compensated this and the maintenance cost. So, the first composite material was steel steel hull and aluminum alloy superstructure. Okay, this is how the history started. Then in late 70s, when there was a fuel crisis and closure of the uh, channel there, ships used to go around the African continent and therefore, they found that economically it is not viable to have small size vessels, rather go for tankers and the bulkers which are at least say 80,000 ton dead weight or more. So, the size increased and when the size increased obviously, the all the dimensions will go in the same proportion more or less. So, the depth increased and the section of section modulus and the bending moment also increased, but ultimately the stress at the outermost fibers which increased to a level with the mild steel cannot take unless you provide additional scantlings there and which made it non-profitable and they went for high tensile steel. And then these big tankers were built. with top and bottom structure H T steel and remaining mild steel. So, here one can say that this much is high tensile steel, this is high tensile steel and the inner core material is all mild steel. So, this also using two different types of steels with two different mechanical properties. So, this was the second type of composite material. So, this is also composite, this is also composite as far as shipbuilding is concerned. But if you talk about structural engineering, then before that people have used composite material like you have the steel girders on a bridge with wooden sleepers at the deck you had these beams and columns made of steel and mortar or the concrete. So, steel as the fibers and concrete as the matrix. So, you can say that this is a composite material of a higher quality that you have a reinforced material there. Okay. So, this composite material was in use for civil engineering material and for ships also one started. And today when we talk about composite construction, 
we basically mean by the composite material. Here it is in true sense the composite construction, but today we are using composite material. And the most popular composite material is the fiber reinforced plastics. Fiber can be of various types. You can have metal fiber, you can have non-metal fiber, you can have uh, organic fiber and so on and so forth. Somehow for ships we use glass fibers. So a special type of glass fiber, fiber which is nothing but glass fiber, reinforced plastic we use. and we say GRP. Glass, uh, glass fiber reinforced plastic GRP, fiber reinforced plastic FRP. So, when we say FRP, it can be any fiber. You can even say the uh, concrete slabs, concrete beam, concrete column, they are also FRP, fiber, re not FRP, they are fiber reinforced concrete, FRC. Okay. So, now, we have these uh, three materials available as composite material. Now, let us take a very simple condition. Let us say that we have a piece of material in which we take one layer as say steel. I am not saying that whether it is mild steel or high tensile steel or whatever steel, just steel and you take another layer on top of it which we say aluminum. We make a test piece and our assumption is that the interface is perfect. Okay, they are glued and then you apply some load here. Let us say when we take the cross section here, this is the steel part, cross section A. and there is the aluminum part. So, let us say that this area is A aluminum and this area is A steel and the first equation I get total area A, total area is A steel plus A aluminum. Okay. Now, I said that the interface is perfect and when I apply a tension, then the elongation in this material will be some epsilon <coughs> and this is same for aluminum and steel. There is no interlayer slippage. So, whatever is the expansion of the total combined material, the same expansion the aluminum part will undergo and also the steel part will go. We also assume that the material whether it is aluminum or steel follows Hooke's law. That means, stress is directly proportional to the strain. 
So, we assume that the elasticity coefficients you have E A for aluminum and E S for steel. Okay. And therefore, we can say that this can be written as E A and material stress here. So, epsilon A can be written as elastic constant of aluminum multiplied by the stress in aluminum, which is equal to okay. So, we can say that sigma in A is equal to So, the stress in the aluminum part can be related to stress in the steel part by this factor. Now, the elastic constants for aluminum and steel, we are saying constants, material properties, they are fairly constant and therefore, this ratio will also be a constant. Right? And this stress can be written in terms of the stress value here. Epsilon, not E. Epsilon is the strain. E epsilon is equal to sigma. E epsilon is equal to sigma, sorry. So, E epsilon stress by strain sigma by this is equal E epsilon is equal to sigma. So, sigma is equal to No, no, just a minute. Uh, you have stress by strain, sigma by E is equal to constant and therefore, E is equal to moment, moment. Let me rewrite it. Yeah, yeah, let me rewrite it. everything you do it without writing and then let me rewrite the whole thing I think it will be clear. this is equal to sigma by E. So, this I write here. Uh, I suppose now it is okay. And therefore, sigma A is equal to
Okay. Yeah. Now this ratio numerically what is the value? I do not know exactly, but I suppose this will be of the order of one third. Okay. So, when the same expansion is given, whatever is stress is generated in the aluminum, uh, sorry, in the steel, in the aluminum part, almost one third of that level will be generated. Obviously, in the aluminum part, <coughs> the stress carrying capacity will be less, the permissible stress level will be less, and therefore, you require slightly thicker plate there. Okay. So, if you try to draw the stress strain diagram here, you will find that if this is the stress here, the corresponding stress here will be, this is one third of this more or less, because it is on this ratio. So, this is your sigma a and this is your sigma s. Okay. So, now when we talk about the section having this material here, then the basic part is we make use of this property. So, this one is say sigma aluminum hmm. is uh, equal to that uh, sigma 2 into a factor, sir. Into a factor, this factor will this be factor. that will be a fraction one third. This is more or less it works out to be depending on the what is the value you have in here. Let me see if any value is given here then we can work it out. S is 200. Huh? S, e, S is uh, 200 some Newton, Putin etcetera, 30 into 10 to the power 6 psi. Let me see if the values are given here. Simply say it is of the order of 3, E s by A is equal to 3. E what is? Uh, 1 by 3, that would answer. 1 third, 1 third of this. just the ratio is given, the actual value is not given. So, okay. uh, steel is 13 to 10 to the power 6 psi, so this will be 10 to the power 7 psi. That's all. So, we can say that we will also write down here A by A s is equal to 1 by 3. Okay, whatever units you use, it will work out to be 1 by 3. And that is why I am saying that this will be the stress level. So, what happens as soon as you put aluminum, the stress in the material comes down to one third because of this ratio. Okay. So, that will try to give you the saving in the material, but as because the material is expensive and to and to withstand this one third of the stress, you require maybe slightly thicker plate, not the same plate thickness as uh, steel, you require slightly thicker plate. So, <coughs> so the weight actually you save, you save the weight, but the cost increases because the material is expensive. Okay. Now, if you have taken this part. And I say that I am having aluminum accommodation here. I am talking about a passenger ship. So, so this is aluminum and this is steel.
it is undergoing bending. So, how do you get the stress here and here? So, first of all you try to draw the midship section, put the aluminum part here. Okay. And then now this stress is coming out to be one third in this ratio. So, what I can say that <coughs> okay, let us try to see here what are the forces coming. So, if I if I say that the contribution here is P 1 hmm, and this contribution is say or P P aluminum and P steel let us say. So, I can say that total force is equal to P aluminum plus P steel. Hmm. What is P aluminum? No, sigma in aluminum into area of aluminum and sigma in steel area in steel. What is sigma aluminum? Now, let me substitute from here. Sigma s let me take out. Okay. So, now whatever is here, this is equal to what? I say this is some sort of a sigma equivalent of steel. Okay. Which is equal to P now. Right sorry not sigma equal area equivalent steel. Now, what is this area equivalent steel? Area equivalent steel is area of steel plus area of aluminum converted to steel with this ratio. So, now this gives me a clue that in the bending case whatever aluminum part is here you convert this aluminum area to equivalent steel area which is equal to okay, this part. So, each area you convert it in this fashion and now this is your steel part after converting the areas now you find out what is I midship. You know the bending moment, you know the I midship, you know the distances and therefore this will give you the section modulus I by Y. Okay. And therefore, m by z will give you the sigma which is in steel. Okay. So, this you will check up against the steel this thing if it is within the elastic limit fine and then you convert back this aluminum area from this equivalent area here. Okay or if you are interested in finding out the stresses, I will first find out the stress in the equivalent steel part
but if my structure is aluminum after a particular height then this will be only one third of that. So, this is this I will take one third ok. If it were steel this was the stress, if it is aluminum this is the stress. So, actually now if I really want to draw correct stress diagram, my stress diagram will be something like this. this is the steel part this is the aluminum part it's ok so in this region this is the stress value in this region this is the stress value Steel, steel. steel. Huh. So directly the stress value which we get. This is steel. Like that, this is steel. Like that, this is steel. Like that, this no, we are getting the steel. Now this level upward is aluminum. So you simply make it one third. Apply this coefficient here. And that modified version I have drawn here. So this is for the steel part, this is for the aluminum this is the equivalent steel stress in this particular aluminum part ok. Now, after knowing this then let us take up this part, this is much simpler in the sense that high tensile steel and the mild steel will have the same elastic modulus ok. Only thing that their um, safe working stress limit will be different. So, you draw the extreme fiber this is a keel and this is your deck. Now, you find that the mild steel has got only this much of capacity say in mild steel the limit is given mild steel the limit is given sigma is equal to say 135 Newton's per millimeter square I am just taking some figure and you are taking some sort of an a high tensile steel where the sigma limit is uh, <coughs> how much 235 no no it's much more than that it can be say 280 okay now i am not getting 280 here i am not getting 280 here and i am not getting uh, less than 135 it is crossing this limit Okay. Now, here the cost from here to here may not be like aluminum 10 times, but definitely is expensive it may be more than 2 times. I do not know about the costing, but I suppose it is of the order of 3 times. So, this is being of 0 stress value and I have been provided with 135 Newtons per millimeter square as the working st stress. So, I take say 135 here. I also take 135 here and then you drop back. So, you find that 135 is up to here. Okay. So, up to this and below this the stress is less than equal to 135. and therefore, this zone 
is suitable for mild steam. Beyond this, it goes beyond the limit of this and I am forced to use high tensile steam. So, I put here high tensile steam. Okay. So, what I am trying to do? It is only the extreme fibers or extreme objects I try to construct from the high tensile and the major hull part I am still making with the mild steam. So, my cost of construction is not increasing. At the same time, I am not allowing that you limit this to 135. If you try to limit this to 135, then what will happen? you have to go with this type of a stress curve which will enormously increase the thickness of the structure. So, now I am not increasing the thickness of the structure, but at the same time with the combination of mild steel and high tensile steel, I am in a position to make an optimum design. I am saving on the cost at the same time I am saving on the weight also. Okay. Uh, this this is not a very big problem. The problem is here. Aluminum welding is a problem. But now aluminum welding has also become easier. In the sense that uh, nowadays you are having a clad uh, aluminum clad steel available. No, uh, the one layer is made of aluminum. It is available uh, in defense vessels they are using it. What happens that normally suppose you are having a 10 millimeter plate. So, out of 10 millimeter 9 millimeter will be steel. So, this part is steel. Okay. And a thin layer here this is aluminum. You make the ship put this layer on the deck, underneath you weld it as usual as a steel, but the top layer is aluminum. So, now when you are erecting an aluminum structure here, you can always have aluminum to aluminum welding, which technique is now available. Earlier there was no aluminum welding available, so one had to do riveting. So, if you are riveting it does not make any difference whether you rivet the uh, steel with aluminum or aluminum with steel. Only thing that uh, having two different materials there will be a galvanic corrosion there. So, there one needs to take a proper care by putting some sort of a uh, jute soaked in red oxide of lead or some such thing and then you rivet it or you put some sort of a composite rubber composite and then try to rivet the thing. So, it is watertight and at the same time you are having it and then you give the deck sheathing etcetera which is also some rubber composite material. But now because of this problem one is getting rid of this and if you really want to reduce the weight of the uh, structure one of the defense vessel I saw was even the main part of the bulkhead was made of aluminum there. So, they used a uh, clad steel ring structure which was connected as a uh, frame and then from the other side aluminum bulkhead was welded to it. Is there any changes in the interface between aluminum and steel? Not change, they have been made with a special technique known as the bombarding. Um, it is amalgam? No, it is a clad, it is basically with the blasting they have to make it they blast the two part in such a fashion that they get stuck to each other. They are fused into each other. Fused into it with, with the help of a blast. That is the cladding process. And because of that process, the cost is more. In fact, earlier this uh, clad stainless steel uh, used to be used in a nozzle, the inside of the nozzle, because 
you are having a gunmetal propeller working in a mild steel, then the gunmetal propeller with, with the uh, corrosion and erosion both will take place because the clearance is only 3 millimeter. So, in the region, uh, region of the propeller tip, one used to use a stainless steel part. Bonding strength will depend on how much fusion intensity. Is there. Oh, that is that is done. We don't have to bother about it. It is all uh, classed item. The item is approved for shipbuilding. It's a shipbuilding quality material. So this is done only to make the similar materials welded. Definitely. Otherwise, how will you weld it? Okay. So now because this technique is available. The construction has become very simpler and therefore, people are going in a big way of aluminum superstructure and I said that not only aluminum superstructure, even the internal bulkheads in a defense vessel where, where you cut down the weight to increase the ammunition. So, all these techniques are available. So, we have done this aluminum part, we have done the high tensile steel part. Okay. And the last material is the composite material itself. Once again, I will not go into the mechanics of all this. It is available, now textbooks are available and in our department a big number of people are working on composite material for ship use marine purpose, including myself, myself, Hamid, Professor Mukhopadhyay and we have got half a dozen of research scholars now working on the topic and more than half a dozen have already finished their PhD. Okay. So, there is a strong group of uh, structural engineers working in this institute under this material and mainly the work is going on in aeronautical engineering, naval architecture, mechanical and to some extent in civil engineering. I do not know whether mathematics people are doing anything on this material or not. There was a time when a strong group on elasticity and uh, yeah, stress and elasticity used to be there in mathematics department, but I do not know at the current time whether that group exists or not. Okay. Now, this composite material which we are talking about is a non-metal. We are talking about GRP, which is being used mainly for shipbuilding. As the name says that the reinforcement, which is filament basically, is the glass material and the matrix is plastic. The tensile strength of this material is very good and this has got a very good bonding property and we have fused the two together to get a material property which suits you. So, the basic advantage of composite material is that the mechanical properties of the material can be engineered by the engineer by choosing the proper mixture of the two and the proportion the layer. Okay. So, the glass is available one is we say that unidirectional you simply have 10 glass pieces which are drawn in one direction and you can lay them in one direction just like that each fiber. But you cannot keep it always straight, it breaks and many a times when we want an isotropic property, we would like that the property of the material, even this we would like to have same strength in any direction. So, isotropic property. So, obtain that we chop the glass pieces into small, small strands and then orient them in at random and they occupy a random this thing and when you pack them in that condition, 
it behaves like a cloth. In fact, all these materials are available in rolls. So, you get a mat out of it in which the glass strands are oriented at random and we say it is a chopped strand mat. You have seen those uh, coir mattresses, if you just take a small layer of it, you can say that chopped strand mat also comes in the similar fashion. Then the strands can be woven because they are drawn in longitudinal direction. So, you can take them in uh, two direction and they can be woven like this and it is woven like a cloth. So, you can have different textures having different types of strands, different number of strands and different thicknesses in different orientations. So, we have woven rowan. This is known as CSM, chop strand mat and woven rowan is known as WR. Okay. Now, when we have taking uh, woven rowan material, then we can use one type of a arrangement of the glass fibers in one direction and a different one in the different direction. Like you have khadi cloth, you know, in one side you have the silk strand, on the other side you have cotton strands and it gives you a different finish. It's something like treading of the tires. Not treading of the tires. Uh, No, there it is one single direction, you are not taking the cloth, I am talking of one single layer. So, it is just woven like a cloth here. Okay. If it is woven in this fashion, then we call it a cloth, but if it is not this way like uh, Hessian cloth, Bora, you can see the material in our department, then it is basically woven rope. So, the cloth finished material is used for the finishing touch, the last layer and the other one for the strength material. And if they are all of same part, two directions, then we say it is a balanced woven rowan. And if in one side more strands are there compared to the other side, then we say that what is the percentage of weaving there. Okay. So, usually you have 50 50 that is balanced, but you can also have 40 60, 30 70, and so on. Now, by varying this, you can get more property in one direction compared to the other direction. Okay. Now, you have the chop strand mat, and difficult for me to draw it like this. Anyway, let me draw it like this. Is he coming to show me five minutes? Five minutes come so fast. This is woven rowan. Okay. So <coughs> these materials are available in specification. We say that three hundred grams per meter square or four fifty grams per meter square. These are standard values available in the market. One can also get say I suppose 100 grams per meter square, 150 grams per meter square. 
Okay. So, you can get these materials in rolls if you take 1 meter square it will weigh so many grams. So, how much a glass content is there in that? Now, when you try to uh, make a sheet you have seen the helmets they have this glass fibers in it. So, when you make a sheet you take a particular volume of that and in that volume how much of glass fibers are there that tells us that what is the volume fraction of this. Usually we will find that the volume fraction of glass uh, that is the fiber we say noted like this is of the order of say 0.3 and it can go up to maximum 0.5. And volume fraction of resin either resin or matrix they say is sometimes we say that volume fraction of vacuum. When you try to mold the thing some bubbles are there, it occupies the volume it is embedded inside, but it does not provide any weight or it does not provide any strength. So, if something is there then we can say that volume fraction of resin is equal to 1 minus V f minus volume fraction of vacuum. Okay. Usually the construction method should be such that volume fraction of the vacuum should be equal to 0. We will do one thing we will uh, continue this in the next class. A little I will not talk much about it I will simply try to tell you about the materials. Take it. Usually, we um, try to analyze our structures based on a stress strain diagram like this or stress displacement diagram. And this is a typical curve, nature of the curve is typical for steel in which we say that the as you start applying the load the stress starts from 0 and more or less it goes linearly up to a point known as the yield point stress. Then there is a small jerk here and, and then again it goes in non-linear way up and then it follows a downward trend. Basically the <coughs> this is a typical um, nature of steel. In other material you will not find this, this part and for steel we say this is the lower yield point and this is the sorry this is the upper lead point and this is the lower yield point and where it is supposed to reach the maximum is known as the ultimate strength. In fact, beyond that the curve goes uh, in this direction, but just before breaking uh, the cross section reduces and we compare the strain on the basis of the original area, whereas the area here starts shrinking and therefore, the stress should increase, but because we are taking original area it comes down. Most of our structure which we which we design, we try to get a stress value which is in the linear part. So, that when you load it and then try to unload it, it follows the same path and that is what we say that the material follows Hooke's law. Stress is proportional to the strain which was given by Hooke. Only this load is moving, but the work done by 
this hinge and this hinge is 3 mp theta, 1 mp here, 2 theta here and this load is moving down. So, it is p into delta and which is equal to p l theta. Therefore, Okay. So, now you see this has got m p by l, this has got m p by l and this mechanism has got 3 m p by l. So, the last mechanism is out of question. It can be either this mechanism or this mechanism because both have got the same ultimate load and it is only the imperfection in the structure or slight imbalance in the load. You say it is 2 p or this is p or there is a small difference in the time of loading the quantity, it can take either of this mechanism for failure. Okay. So, this is how the beam problems are solved and uh, finding out what is the m p from the section modulus, one can try to design and based on this, one finds that uh, as we can see from the rectangular section that your shape factor is 1.5 in fact, you are getting some 50 percent additional strength there. For other sections also, the T section which I have given you, you will find that some 15 percent or 30 percent you will get extra there. So, depending on the shape, you get an enhancement and if you base your design on the basis of this uh, elastic theory, though we have assumed that it is fully elastic and fully plastic, that means in the plastic region, we have assumed that once it comes to the yield point stress it stays there. Whereas, in true picture even if you modify it, it is uh, linearly elastic and linearly plastic. It is basically non-linearly non plastic, but even if you consider it to be linearly uh, plastic, then also though you are underestimating, but still you are having some additional strength there. And this way if you try to design uh, some structures, then you re really try to save some load. Uh, some material and make a lighter vessel. Okay. So, this is what I wanted to cover here.